My name is Bob Forward. I uh, have been working in children's television practically since I was a kid myself. Uh, I think I started in 19 uh, working on Beast Wars. I mean, sorry, working on He-Man. Uh, uh, I was a storyboard artist first. Um, uh, from then, I, from storyboard, I moved into writing because I discovered that writing allowed me to cause the problems instead of trying to solve them. And uh, I've slowly moved further and further in the field. I, uh, I enjoy cartoons and I enjoy animation in general and I enjoy children's programming. Uh, now that I've got kids of my own, it's been a lot of fun. My wife's a storyboard artist for Disney and uh, so my kids have pretty much grown up believing that every parent in the world leaps out of bed on Saturday morning and runs downstairs to watch television and watch the Saturday morning cartoons. And of course, uh, um, for them, their parents, uh, they don't know that not every parent not only watches the cartoons, but doesn't go, ah, they ruined it, uh, which is what tends to happen here. So uh, I've, I've been working a long time in the field, as I said, and I uh, um, uh, was interested in uh, learning more about it. Uh, even when I worked at Filmation, I was constantly driving my boss crazy because I would never be at my desk. I would be down watching the animators or I would be down... Uh, you know, trying to see how the ink and paint worked or watching the guys shooting the camera, uh, everything. I just, I wanted to learn it all. And so uh, over the years, I've managed to do a lot of that. And uh, with Beast Wars, it was my first chance to actually try directing. I especially loved CG. Uh, once I started it, I just realized this, this was a medium that uh, was a lot of fun. Um, it was a medium in which... Uh, unlike 2D, and 2D is great, I, I love 2D, um, but uh, uh, it's, it's its own medium, but the, the fact remains that whenever you're working in 2D, you're very aware that they did it better 50 years ago. I mean, for one reason or another, I mean, you, you look at what you do and, you know, it's pretty good. It's not Pinocchio. Uh, I mean, it's very good considering uh, many things, but the neat thing about CG is it's always getting better. And so everything that you're doing, every time you go into work, it was exciting because you'd be saying to yourself, we're gonna do things today that have never been seen before. I mean, every day you were breaking new ground. Every day somebody would go, look what I figured out. And, and you'd be looking at it, you're going like, that is really cool. And no one's ever done it before, at least not on a television budget. And so that was what made it exciting to work on a show like Beast Wars. And that was why once the, you know, uh, time for contact renegotiations contracts came up, uh, one of the writers in my contract was, I wanted to direct an episode, and actually Mainframe was really great about it. They uh, they let me come up there. Uh, I lived there for four months. I worked with a very talented crew, and uh, I had a terrific time. Uh, uh, and in that process, I learned <laughs> that it, directing is quite addictive, and I've been more or less trying to get uh, chances to do it ever since. Larry Dottilio and I had a, a really good working relationship. Uh, uh, I think we complemented each other really well. Uh, Larry was very involved in, uh, in the details, how things worked. Um, he really liked um, coming up with really interesting characters, really almost reprehensible characters sometimes. Uh, and uh, and uh, he would always try and work out the rules of the universe that we were creating. I tended to kind of wing it more, I have to admit. Uh, I wanted to get right into the action. Uh, I, you know, uh, I'd rather not have characters sitting around and talking if I can have them speeding over uh, the landscape and talking while firing their weapons at the same time. It's, you know, uh, it tends to run expensive that way, but... Uh, uh, eh, and from Larry, I, I did learn a lot, uh, and from Beast Wars, uh, I learned, I think, more about writing character than, uh, than I'd ever learned before. And part of that was simply because Beast Wars had such a limited number of characters that we, we had to work with, such a limited number. I mean, we were always writing what we called inside the glass box. Um, uh, uh, we, we felt like we were constantly enclosed in this glass box of we only have a certain number of sets, we only have a certain number of characters. Um, our job 
was to keep the audience always looking inward so nobody would notice how close against the walls we constantly were of what we couldn't do. Instead, we would concentrate, we would make sure that the story concentrated on what we could do and what we could do really well. And, you know, we had learned from the animators, and one thing we could do really well was we got great acting out of those robots and those uh, and those animal forms. I mean, the, those guys at Mainframe were just tremendous animators, and it was, it was all keyframe stuff, you know, they were just really, really good at that. That stuff. We learned we could trust them to give us expressions and, and things that would really sell the emotion of a moment. And um, because we, you know, had a limited number of characters, we couldn't just constantly be doing shows in which we were introducing somebody's cousin or something like that. So instead, we, uh, we just had the characters start to bicker constantly. So they were always on edge. And that just became really dynamic. And it's something that I've, you know, carried through ever since. It's just how neat it is if the characters aren't always agreeing with each other all the time. Uh, I think that kind of puzzled the fans at first uh, that were fans of the original G1 series because in the G1 series it was basically Optimus would issue a command and everybody would follow it and the same thing with Megatron and and that had kind of a team player aspect to it but they had nine zillion characters they could mess with and they were you know had constant you know wars between huge armies we had 14 characters we couldn't budge on that and uh, so our characters had to squabble a lot and in that squabbling it allowed us to really bring out some ne really neat aspects of those characters. I'll be honest, when, we, when Larry and I started out, we did not know a whole lot about the Transformers universe. We didn't know there were news groups out there about it. We didn't know uh, very much. We, we did know that Hasbro knew about it because they emphasized. They had these huge fan followings and were like, yeah, yeah. And they said, oh, yeah, and we got these news groups. Yeah, yeah. Um, but once we started working on it and we started messing with the Beast Wars uh, concept, I think I wrote the pilot without really knowing anything. Um, uh, but I made mention of a great war. Well. I just meant, you know, okay, there was this great war, and that kind of explains why the Predacons and the Maximals uh, were constantly fighting. I just, and, uh, but the, at that point, um, Larry clued me into the news groups that he found about the Alt Toys Transformers and other things that you found on the internet, and they were very excited, and they assumed that it was talking about the war between the Autobots and the Decepticons. Uh, and and we started to look at this stuff, and as we were reading the news groups, we were sort of lurking for quite a long time, just reading the fan reactions to stuff. Uh, and and we can't help it, we're writers. We see little seeds here and there that we could sort of play in that actually helped tie it into the original Transformers. And um, uh, neither a mainframe nor Hasbro seemed to mind if we actually just sprinkled in these little seeds, and in many ways, we were dropping in seeds that we had no idea what we were what we were going to do with them. But they just seemed like good little flavors at the time. Uh, uh, one of the guys from Hasbro, Anthony, I believe, um, uh, had suggested a, a golden disc from Voyager was was the reason that they had come to Earth this time. And uh, we didn't even know at the time whether we were going to put it in the past or whether it was going to be just a completely different planet altogether. We, uh, it was very hard to get a solid decision from marketing because they, they themselves were trying to figure out exactly where they were going with this show. Um, so we put two moons in the sky, figuring just in sort of a random way. It's like, okay, if we decide this is going to be Earth later on, we can always blow it, we'll blow up a moon. We'll figure out a way how to how to blow up a moon, and lo and behold, that's exactly what we ended up doing. And it tied into a huge story arc that made it look like we really knew what we were doing this whole time. And uh, frankly, no, we were scrambling constantly, trying to go like, oh God, thank God we did this back here because now we can pull this up and uh, and make it a big important plot point that we had alluded to way back here. Uh, everything from the just the little um, uh, Stonehenge type uh, rock formations that. Uh, Again, that was just something, we had one. Mainframe happened to have one around, so they threw it in there and we talked about it. Uh, and uh, uh, and lo and behold, we ended up with aliens and uh, the Vok and everything else uh, and blowing, and that ended up blowing up the moon. Uh, but it, 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 uh, uh, it really was, we were winging it constantly. And that was, if I may say so, something I was better at uh, was was just coming up with uh, convincing reasons to make it look like uh, we had actually known what we were doing. After Beast Wars uh, was over and uh, um, I'd had a really good experience as a director on Beast Wars, one of the things that happened on Beast Wars was when I went up there to direct, um, it was not something that I had done before, and um, but I had been a storyboard artist before. So in my 
belief that I needed to know exactly what I was doing because I needed to be able to get a show done even though I'd never done one before. I storyboarded the entire episode myself. Uh, that was not something that Mainframe had ever really done before. Occasionally they would do partial storyboards. Most often they would simply wing it. Um, uh, they would, they would, the director would try to explain to an animator kind of what he had in mind and the animator would do it and then they would tweak it around a little bit. No one had ever tried to do a storyboard and an animatic before, literally to shoot the storyboard so that it was 22 minutes and eight frames long, which was how long we were doing these things, and uh, and then just do those individual scenes. And to be honest, the, the animators were a little resistant at first. They had never really dealt with it before. They quickly came around. Um, and uh, what was unusual about it was we started in Act 3. I mean, uh, we actually started with the very hardest scenes because I knew they were going to take the longest to do. and. If we couldn't do those scenes, there was no point in doing the show. I mean, we had to be able to do these scenes. Uh, the, you know, Dinobot getting just blasted, and, and, and Walter built three different versions of. Walter was my uh, senior animator, uh, and uh, he built three different versions of uh, Dinobot in various stages of destruction, and uh, and you know, we we mapped out which ones needed to be used in which scenes, and uh, and actually, I threw um, uh, the management into a bit of a panic because we seemed like we were really be really behind compared to the other crews. The other crews would start off with a lot of easy stuff, you know. Uh, they would start from the beginning and work their way to the end and they would take a lot of the dialogue stuff. Um, and, uh, but what they didn't realize was that my crew was working on the very hardest stuff from the beginning. Towards the end, we were breezing through it, and they were starting to try and give us, I, I almost wanted to resist, you know, it's like, no, we can do it. And, uh, and we literally finished a day early, which no one had ever done before. And the crew was so exhausted, they said, don't tell anybody, they'll make us go work on other crews. So, so we just, everybody had to come in, and they all had to sit at their desks, but nobody had to do anything. And everybody just like quietly, you know, uh, celebrated uh, uh, not having to work for a solid day um, uh, and you know it was a, uh, it was great and uh, ever since uh, mainframe has used storyboards uh, uh, constantly and you know they they saw that there was a, a good reason for it um, and uh, and I took that experience and uh, moved over to supervising producer on a series called Dan Dare which was done by uh, foundation amongst other people uh, and uh, used my experience there to I, I was not the director but basically I was the person on site to make decisions and and just with that show we just had to get it done I mean uh, it had had financial difficulties amongst other things and uh, it was very important no matter what you didn't go back you didn't have to you know retakes you just we couldn't do it you know it's like we had to meet the budget we had to meet the time and through that um, uh, again, I was doing all the storyboard changes because nobody had nobody had budgeted for a storyboard supervisor. So basically, I had to do that. Uh, I I had a lot, I wore a lot of hats on that episode, uh, on that series. But what that taught me was just I knew how to get things done. And uh, so when my kids actually started messing around with video cameras and and starting trying to make their own movies, and and as kids always will get a little overwhelmed, they get lost. Um, but I had already been working with editing equipment. I, I already knew how to get stuff done. I said, you know, if we're going to do this, let's do one. And, uh, and they were, sure, why not? Uh, I had a son who was working as a, an older son who was working as a video editor who had showed me some neat things that could be done with uh, video compositing. I had a, a younger son who was our, at that time a brown belt in karate. Um, uh, he had some friends who were willing to do fight scenes and, uh, and we just knew that we could probably get away with shooting some cool stuff with toys and the end result was we wrote a little short 15 minute film called Agent 12 and uh, over the course of about six months we spent $900 and, uh, and we made a little short film that uh, is given how cheap we did it and we did the whole thing in my garage. Um, it's pretty damn cool, and uh, and the kids had a tremendous time. We all had a great time, and we got it done, which I think uh, is what surprised 
people more than anything else. My uh, friend Frank Becker did the music. He did a great job. We, uh, Angus and I did the sound effects all by ourselves. Uh, um, uh, we, I mean, we, were, we had him dancing on metal chairs to do the footsteps and, and, uh, and uh, smacking the chairs to do the hits and the kicks. And, and, uh, but the important thing was that by doing a storyboard, by pinning up the discs, by keeping track of everything we needed to do, uh, we did manage to do a 12-year-old super spy movie with rocket-powered jet cars and, uh, and, uh, and giant robots and everything else, uh, and we got it done. And, uh, uh, and because of that, uh, we're doing another one. Uh, and it's actually, it's gotten us a lot of attention, and it got us enough attention so that when the new um, their, the new Thunderbird series came out, uh, which involved miniatures, basically toys and blowing stuff up and everything that we were already doing, the producer saw Agent 12 and I got hired. So, <laughs> so Agent 12 actually got me a job, uh, and uh, uh, and for that I am you know grateful in and of itself. Uh, but uh, uh, just because, obviously, I knew what I was doing when it came to working with miniatures for dealing with uh, the kind of things that they needed to deal with. Because when we're 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 just starting the Thunderbird series, and that's. You know, it's it's not CG. It's all being done with miniatures and puppets and everything else. But uh, because of the Agent 12 experience, I know very much of what they're going through, and uh, and uh, I believe that's helping me in the in the writing of that. As far as a place in my career, Beast Wars has just got a big warm spot in my heart. I uh, uh, I don't think I've ever had so much fun working on a series. The amount of emotion that that, sh that Beast Wars uh, sponsored uh, still stuns me. I mean, I still, when I meet fans and they, and they just tell me how much it meant to them, um, it, 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 it just, uh, I, almost, I almost want to cry. I almost want to apologize. I almost want to say, I'm sorry, a lot of the time I was just like jamming something out, you know, uh, uh, I, if I'd known it was going to like affect you this much, I would have worked harder at it. Uh, uh, but still, I think that for sort of free-swinging, uh, swashbuckling spirit that uh, Beast Wars had made it, gave it part of its charm. Uh, and I think if we'd worked hard at it, harder at it, it would have gotten overworked. Uh, I think it worked well, just the way it was.